I'm Paula Montgomery. I'll be your service leader this morning. I want to welcome you all to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Pensacola. Um, regardless of who you are, how you identify yourself, how old you are, how young you are, you are welcome in this church. So now I want you to pay close attention to the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism as they will appear on the screen. chalice lighting this morning. We gather this hour as people of faith with joys and sorrows, gifts and needs. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning in celebration of the life we share together. Okay, now I'd like to invite the choir up. We're going to sing our opening hymn and invite you to join us to stand and sing number 113 in your gray hymnal. continue to stand and we will have our say our covenant together love is the spirit of this church and service its law this is our covenant 
to dwell together in peace, to speak the truth in love, and to help one another. Now I invite you to sit down and we'll have some centering music. Music is by a local um, artist. His name is Michael De Maria, and he plays the Indian flute. Okay, now we have a time for all ages. And if you have heard me speak before, you may have heard me tell this story before, because I think it illustrates a very good point. There are three boys one about 13 or 14, he's had his growth spurt. There's one about 10, a little shorter, and one about five, very short. The one who is 13 or 14 can look over this fence where construction is going on and he's so excited and he's telling his two little buddies what's happening. This enormous tractor is doing this or this great big crane is doing that. And the middle-sized boy is jumping up, and every once in a while, he can peep over the fence and just barely see. But the little one, he never gets to see. There is a man who comes over in a hard hat to talk to these three boys. I know that you all really are interested in what's going on. And so there's a stack of boxes over there to the side and he drags one over for the little boy and the little boy stands on it and he can look over the fence and then the middle boy is still hopping so he looks and he sees a box and he goes and gets a box and stands on the box the tall one of course never needed the box but he's very pleased that his two friends have also got boxes to stand on and i want you to think about was it fair was it fair that the littlest one got the biggest box? <laughs> Was it fair that the tallest one got no box at all? It's just something to think about. What is justice? Okay, that's my, that's my little story. And now we will sing the children out to their classrooms. Go now in peace, go now in peace. May the spirit of love surround you everywhere, everywhere you may go. As you know, this church is wholly supported by the gifts from our members and our friends. At this point, we will receive with gratitude your, your money. <laughs> I had to say that fancy. Okay. Is this the fifth Sunday collection? Oh yes, this is the fifth Sunday collection. I forgot to mention that. On every month that has five Sundays, we choose a local um, not-for-profit organization doing good work in our community and we donate the collection to that organization. So today's, today's uh, offering will go to Just Pensacola.
We have a few joys, concerns, and sorrows to share with you this morning. Patty Underwood writes, My sister-in-law, Janet Underwood, has fallen and crushed her kneecap. Thank you. We would appreciate thoughts and prayers for her. I'm sorry. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Patty Underwood's sister-in-law has fallen and crushed her kneecap. So thoughts and prayers for her. Trista Bluen says, I'm so happy that after almost nine months of debilitating fatigue, brain fog, my doctors were able to find medication to bring me back. I am so grateful for my body and mind. And Penny says, I am grateful that my friend Laura brought items for the yard sale, saw familiar faces, and decided to come to our service today. <laughs> Welcome. And Mary says, no, Marcy says, I'm sorry, my husband Ron is recovering and healing after his back surgery. Good news. <laughs> And Cammie, one of our great visitors today, Cammie Young says, our 36-year-old son is struggling with lifestyle choices that are negatively impacting his well-being. And we want to be positive. We want to be positive impact support people as parents. We want to be positive impact support people as parents. Yes, thoughts and prayers. Okay. And thank Kaylee for being our assistant here. <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce Kaylee. Kaylee had graduated from New College of Florida where she double majored in economics and Spanish language and culture. While a student, she volunteered as a guardian ad litem and worked as a Spanish teaching assistant in her department. Kaylee spent most of her childhood growing up in several countries throughout Latin America. In college, she lived in Guatemala where she helped fulfill an education program. Kaylee worked as an associate organizer at Peace Palm Beach before being hired to, as the lead organization organizer and executive director of Just Pensacola. She has a strong commitment to Just Pensacola's vision for doing justice and turning Pensacola into a beloved community for all people. Kaylee is originally from Escambia County and is excited to be home and near family. And we welcome Kaylee. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Can you hear me OK? OK, good. My name is Kaylee Williams. I'm the director of Just Pensacola. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm so excited to be here with you all today. Um, for those of you who don't know, Just Pensacola is an interfaith organization. And we actively seek to uncover injustice and mobilize our community through the power of organized people to create, win, to create and win just fair solutions for our county. And I often, when I, I've come and talked here a few times now, and I often talk about how our faith brings us together and how we have a lot of different faiths that join together to do justice. Um, but today, I hope you bear with me because I'm going to take it, I'm going to try a different angle, but you're my first audience for this. So, but we're going to, I want to talk a little bit more about another thing that brings us together, which is the human experience and more deeply the human the emotions that we feel as human beings. And so to help me explore that topic, I'm gonna to read an excerpt from one of my favorite books, Untamed by Glennon Doyle, um, about an experience she had with injustice and human emotion. So here we go. Several years ago, my daughter's Tish's teacher called and said that there was a situation at school. During a discussion about wildlife, she'd mentioned to the class 
that the polar bears were losing their homes and food sources because of the melting ice caps. She showed the students a photo of a dying polar bear as an example of the many effects of global warming. The rest of the kindergartners thought that, thought that this was sad information, but not sad enough to keep them from, you know, soldiering on to recess. <laughs> not Tish. The teacher reported to me that when the lesson ended and the other kids popped off, to, to the, uh, popped off the carpet to run outside, Tish remained seated, alone, mouth wide open, stunned into paralysis, her little shocked face asking, what? Did you just say the polar bears are dying? Because the earth is melting? The same earth we live on? Did you just drop this little tidbit of terror on us at circle time? Tish eventually made it outside, but was unable to participate in recess that day. The other kids tried to get her off the bench to play Foursquare with them, but she remained close to the teacher, wide-eyed asking, do the grown-ups know about this? What are they going to do? Are other animals in trouble too? Where is that hungry polar bear's mom? For the next month, our family's life revolved around polar bears. We bought polar bear posters and prepared and paper Tish's wall with them. To remember, Mom, I've got to remember. We sponsored four polar bears online. We talked about polar bears at dinner, at breakfast, during carpool, and at parties. We discussed polar bears so much and so insistently, in fact, that after a few weeks, I began to hate polar bears with every fiber of my being. <laughs> I began to rue the day the polar bears were ever born. <laughs> I tried everything I could think to yank Tish out of her polar bear abyss. I coddled her, I snapped at her, and finally, I just lied to her. I asked a friend to send me an official e email pretending to be the president of Antarctica, announcing that once and for all, the ice caps were fixed and all the polar bears were suddenly A-OK. -okay. I opened that fraudulent email and called Tish into her room into, oh my God, baby, come here, look, what I just got, good news. Tish read the email silently, then turned slowly toward me with a scathing look of scorn. She knew the email was fake because she was sensitive, not stupid. The polar bear saga continued full force. One night, I tucked Tish into bed and was tiptoeing out of her room with the joy of a mother who was almost to the promised land. Everybody's asleep, and I've got my couch and my carbs and Netflix, and no one is allowed to touch me or talk to me until the sun rises. Hallelujah. I was closing the door behind me when Tish whispered, Wait, Mom. Damn it. What, honey? It's the polar bears. Oh, hell no. I walked back to her bed and, and stared down at her a little manically. Tish looked up at me and said, Mommy. I just can't stop thinking. It's the polar bears now, and nobody cares. So next, it's going to be us. Then she rolled over and fell asleep and left me alone in the dark room, stunned into paralysis myself. I stood over her, eyes wide, arms wrapped around my body. Oh my God, the polar bears. We have to save the mother freaking polar bears. Next, it's going to be us. What is wrong with us? Then I looked down at my baby and thought, ah, you're not crazy to be heartbroken over the polar bears. The rest of us are crazy not to be. Tish couldn't go to recess because she was paying attention to what her teacher said. As soon as she heard the polar bear news, she let herself feel the horror and know the wrongness and imagine the inevitable outcome. Tish is sensitive and that is her superpower. The opposite of sensitive is not brave. It's not brave to refuse to pay attention, to refuse to notice, to refuse to feel and know and imagine. The opposite of sensitive is insensitive, and that's no badge of honor. Tish senses. Even as the world tries to speed by her, she's slowly taking it, taking it in. Wait. Stop. That thing he said about the polar bears. It made me feel something and wonder something. Can we stay there for a moment? I have feelings. I have questions. And I'm not ready to run outside to recess yet. 
In most cultures, folks like Tish are identified early, set apart as shamans and medicine people, poets and clergy. They are considered eccentric, but critical to the survival of the group because they are able to hear things that others don't hear and see things that others don't see and feel things that others don't feel. The culture depends on the sensitivity of a few because nothing can be healed if it's not sensed first. But our society is so bent on expansion, power, and efficiency at all costs that the folks like Tish, like me, are inconvenient. We slow the world down. We're on the bow of the Titanic pointing, crying out, iceberg, iceberg, while everyone else is below deck yelling back, we just want to keep dancing. It's easier to call us broken and dismiss us than to consider that we are responding appropriate, appropriately to a broken world. My little girl is not heartbroken. She is a prophet, and I want to be wise enough to stop with her, ask her what she feels, and listen to what she knows. So, and with that, I wanted to ask, how many people here have participated either this year or at another time in a Jazz Pensacola house meeting? Ooh, so many hands, it's good. So, if you don't know what a house meeting is, it's a group where about 10 people get together and we are in relationship with one another uh, to share our stories. And this year, um, I've had, I've been to a few, quite a few house meetings, and I'm not gonna lie to you, I've had a few moments where I wanted to check out mentally because the emotions that were coming up during these house meetings were inconvenient, getting in the way of my productivity, and also just hard. One story in particular, well, there's a lot of stories that I think of, but I heard one story this year of a woman, I'll call her Linda. Linda's husband passed away. She was, a, he was an essential worker, and he passed away during COVID. She, he, they, it wasn't a quick passing away. It was slow, and there was a lot of medical debt that built up, and they had two children. Um, Lin, uh, Linda and her two children, after the passing of their father, there wasn't, there wasn't much resources left behind. She, got, she, was, she was being drowned in medical debt, and overnight her rent went up by $500. Um, Linda is now homeless with her two children, couch surfing. And I wish I could say that that was an isolated incident. We've heard hundreds of stories over the last couple years, and especially in the last three months, that are really similar to the one of Linda's. People in our community are being forced out of their homes, right? Because they can't afford their rents. Who here knows someone with an affordable housing story? A lot of people. Are, and those aren't the only stories we heard. I have one amazing high schooler. She's actually having her house meeting today. And when I asked her why she wanted to host a house meeting and what makes her angry, she said, well, my favorite English teacher had to quit because she couldn't afford her health insurance. Our kids, us, the people around us, our neighbors, um, are going through a lot of things. And this story that I read today reminds me that it's okay to feel those feelings that when you hear those stories. Um, I think that all of us have an inner tish, an inner, an inner child that, that becomes uncomfortable when they hear things that are sad in the world. And not everyone is sensitive, but there's other emotions that, um, that might arise. It might be anger. It might just be a deep sadness. It might be anxiety. Um, but these emotions are trying to tell us something. They're trying to help us find the next thing. So I, again, in the, in the story it says, even as the world tries to speed by her, she is slowly taking it in. Wait, stop. That's the thing, that thing you said about polar bears. It made me feel something and wonder something. Can we stay there for a moment? I have feelings, I have questions, and I'm not ready to run outside to recess yet. 
The listening process that we're in in just Pensacola is, is the beginning of the rest of the year. And it's not just another, it's not just another step, but instead it's a time for us to gather and to feel our feelings and to let us, our feelings guide us towards the next step, towards action. Um, without any of these feelings, there's no way that we're gonna be able to create the massive and necessary changes in our city. If we don't listen to these feelings, people like Linda and her two children are not gonna be able to get housing for her family. So as we leave here today and as we go into the next week, I would really like to leave everyone with a challenge that the next time that you have an inconvenient emotion about the state of our community and you wanna put it in your back pocket or put it in a box in the closet, or maybe just set it on fire and walk in the other direction, that you actually just put it right in front of you. And you look at that emotion, and you ask what it's, and you look at it and you ask it, what do you want? What do you need from me? What, what are you trying to tell me? And that you follow that instinct, and to put that emotion into action. Um, I hope that one of the ways that your emotions tell you to act is with us at Just Pensacola. We are, on, upcoming on November 7th, we have our Community Problems Assembly. It's going to be at the historic St. Joseph's Catholic Church, where you're actually going to hear stories from the community, like the one I just shared today, um, of folks coming together and um, mourning the stories, but also getting excited for the possibilities and finding the hope in the next steps that we're gonna take. Um, so yeah, that is, that's all I have for you today, but I really appreciate all of your time. I know that the UU congregation has been involved in justice from the very, Just Pensacola since the very beginning. You all turned out more than your average worship attendance at the Nehemiah Action last year. So I know that this, and based on the based on your, the values at, in this congregation. I know justice is at the center. So thank you all for being so dedicated to the cause and I'm excited to be in this fight with you. Just Pensacola is not afraid to take on big local problems and we are making progress. We have a closing hymn, I believe that comes next. It's, we are building a new way. The words will be up here on, on the screen.
We're grateful for this time together. We're grateful for Kaylee's coming and sharing with us what's going on with Just Pensacola. We're grateful for the offering which will go to Just Pensacola. And in closing words, grant us the ability to find joy and strength not by a strident call to arms, but in stretching out our arms to grasp our fellow creatures in the striving for justice and peace. Amen. Blessed be. Namaste.